So I'd like to address that, uh, that score issue on Credit Karma versus the bank score. The, you know, a part of this dance is understanding that the scores that I pull are relevant to the type of lending that I do. So if you've got an account set up with Equifax, TransUnion, or Experience, you probably know that they give you several different scores depending on what the model looks like. They'll give you scores that talk about, hey, if you were going to get a car loan, this is what your rate would be. If you were going to get a mortgage, this is what your rate would be. If you were going to get a credit card, this is what your rate would be. Well, that, that's similar to that. So what they do is they kind of cater it. So it's very, very hard to, I guess, um, know what your credit score is going to be across the board because they have different, um, they have different parameters for which they gauge these and different, um, um, I guess, different equations and calculations for what they take into account versus like who's going to pay their mortgage versus who's going to pay their car loan. I know that doesn't sound like it makes a lot of sense, but they back it up with a lot of data, you know, and they're all proprietary, right? So all these algorithms are proprietary. Uh, we can only go with some of the knowledge that they give us. Uh, this has been brought to court multiple times, and uh, time after time, it's been found that they're proprietary. So, you know, unfortunately, we've got some of the basic information, but we don't really know what goes, uh, what truly goes into each one of these algorithms. So, getting back on task with the question, though, why is your score different on credit karma than it is versus what the bank pulls? A lot of times, what these credit card companies will do, these credit reporting companies, is you got to remember their businesses, right? Um, they make a certain amount of business with us, with, with the, the creditors. And then they make another uh, significant amount of business with customers, right? So one of the things that we found that's happened or developed over the last 20 years is that they give us our risk score, right? Which they, you know, there is some potential liability if they risk that, uh, or if they write that score with a different risk rating than supposed to be, right? Then what? Then, then if we start seeing a lot of delinquencies on 800 credit scores, we're going to wonder what's going on. And they could be held liable for that. We could we have some recourse as a bank. Um, the the easier one, right? In, in my opinion, uh, the, the one that's easier for the credit bureaus is to be able to sell you something, right? Sell the, the end user, the end consumer, something. And so typically, what they'll do is they will send they will sell you a score, but they'll sell you a score on a different using a different algorithm on a on different parameters. So when you look at your score it looks like it's higher because when you take a look at what scale it's on, my scale goes from probably, you know, 350 to 840. That's my scale. They may start this, the, the consumer friendly scale. They may start at 500 and it may go up to 990. So you pull, let's say your Equifax score and your Equifax score says that, well, you're, you're at an 860. Well, hopefully, right away, you realize that something is wrong. That's definitely a consumer-friendly score because um, no lender can pull a score that's above 840. So if you've got an 860, you're probably still a good score, but you're on a different scale. Um, there's been nothing uh, – I have not seen anything in the news. I've not seen anything in the legislature. I've not seen anything judicially that is preventing them from doing that because they're just providing a product. Um, if you ask me, it is a little bit, um, uh, it, 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 I don't want to say deceitful, but it is. Uh, there's no, uh, what they should be giving you is the same thing that they're giving us, and that way everybody would be on the same, we'd have a shared understanding, a common operating picture. And right now we don't exactly have that because a lot of times, and I get this all the time. I got it a lot more about five, ten years ago than I am right now. People are starting to understand it, but you know, people would come in and they would bring me, their printout of their credit score, and they'd say, look, I'm a BZ 790, you know, and then when I pull it, it's a 690 or a 710 or something like that, and they're always baffled and scratching their head, and then I have to show them, here's the scale that they gave you this score, and here's the scale on my score, and that's why it's so different. So uh, just something to keep in the back of your mind, um, you know, if you want, uh, you know, if you want your credit pulled or you want a score or something like that or whatever, and you want it to look like the lender score, it probably has to come from a, a soft pull from the bank. That's probably the best way uh, for you to get something like that because you're probably not going to get the same one that you would normally get otherwise. Um, looking at the other question, does someone's good credit make someone's challenge in credit good? No, nope, it doesn't. Uh, it helps, right? Um, it can help. It can, let's say, 
if you're applying for something and you've got a, let's say you're on the cusp, you're on the bubble, which is about 640, 650 is the bubble, right? So let's say you're right around the bubble. Well, you can bring somebody in with an 800 credit score to cosign, right? But essentially what the bank is telling you then is they're telling you, we're not really relying on your uh, credit history. We're relying on that 800 credit history. That's why we ask them to, to come in and to uh, cosign. So it doesn't really make your uh, credit good. Because what we found long term is we found that, let's say we've got business partners, right? They go into business, and what ends up happening is the bills end up getting paid more towards the person who paid their bills um, in an atypical late fashion versus the person who paid their bills in a, a routine and uh, uh, typical fashion. So that's what we ended up looking at finding out over time. So, you know, it, it, it is helpful. It's good to have. Uh, at the same time, it's not going to negate bad, uh, bad credit. All right, so let's get into each one of these individuals. A 35% payment history. So this is a record of your on-time and late payments. So too easy, I'm not going to tell your intelligence, you know what this is. Um, it's based on DLA, right, date of last activity. So obviously the things that happened more recently are more heavily weighted. Like I mentioned to you earlier, something that happened three, four years ago probably isn't impacting your score much. But something that happened last month is really going to have an impact on it. Um, you can see here, uh, dispute if there's an error. Um, dispute if there's not error. If, if you want my honest, you know, down to down to earth opinion, uh, dispute it no matter what. If something got on there and it was even an accident, your vacation, or let's just say uh, you got sick, or something happened or whatever, uh, call them up, negotiate, and if it doesn't work, dispute it. Because a lot of times, you know, they, they mess up with their documentation or someone just is lazy and doesn't want to do the work. So they always, always push back. Always. It does not hurt to push back. And the other thing that I'd say is if you don't get the response that you want the first time you call, call and talk to someone else. Right? A lot of times, you know, you'll get that one sticky person who just refuses to do anything to help you. You call back, you get somebody else who's a little bit more um, amenable and willing to work with you. So... Just try, try, try again because it's important to get, you know, to get these things fixed and to get things off there, even if it is your fault, right? Um, none of us are infallible. We all make mistakes um, and issues happen. So you have to, you have to treat this like the fight it is. You really do. You've got to go over a tooth and nail. And I'll tell you, um, we as military members, you know, you know, we kind of have a different experience than a lot of other people. I'll just, uh, I'll just share one real quick story with you. The last time I deployed to the Middle East, um, I was in all sorts of areas. So I deployed to the Middle East, and, uh, you know, I wasn't in a lot of areas where you could easily make a call or remedy situations because um, there was a lot of austere environment. Well, when I was going there, I knew that, uh, you know, at t wouldn't be super awesome uh, where I was going, but I knew T-Mobile would just by, you know, talking to the people who were there already. So I had paid off my at t bill, paid off my at t phone, switched over to T-Mobile, deployed, and now I'm in an area where I don't really have um, a lot of contact with the outside world. Here and there I do, but I'm not really getting regular um, mail. I'm not really getting real, regular phone calls. I uh, found out that um, AT&T had charged me a $50 early termination fee on my contract, even though they're not supposed to do that because we're military, right? So under, I think it's ESGR or USERA, it's one of the two. Um, they're not supposed to do an early termination fee, but they did it anyway. And since I wasn't around to answer the mail, uh, they put it on my credit report. So um, that caused a major problem, <laughs> obviously. Here I am, a banker, an officer, and now all of a sudden I've got this $50 uh, a late, late payment or charge off or whatever it is. And so I had, that was something that I had to deal with. And I had to fight them tooth and nail. And in the end, they knew they were wrong and they took it off. But I got to tell you, it took me about 12, 13 months to get that thing off my credit report. So, uh, you, you know, we, we are not immune uh, as the military and companies will do what they can do to get you to pay them the money that they feel that they deserve. You just have to make sure to fight it uh, appropriately and with the appropriate tools. So I went after them week after week, week after week, week after week, showed them the documentation, eventually got it off. Uh, but it was it was not easy. It was worth it when it was off, but it was definitely not easy. So let's see here. I got a question in the chat. If you're an authorized user on someone's credit card who got behind in a payment, will help if the person removes you on the account. So if you're just an authorized user, 
and it's not being reported on your credit, um, it won't really make a difference. So it really depends. If you're just an authorized user, then you might be almost like how you're, you might get a card for your child, right? If they're just authorized to use the card and it has no impact on their personal credit, then it's really not going to make, you know, it's a six and one half dozen or it's not going to make a difference. However, if you're co-signed on that, right, if you're a co-applicant on that, um, then potentially, yes. So if you're both on it, you're both responsible for it and they pay it late, that's going to impact your credit for sure. So you need to distinguish between the two, uh, the two roles. Are you in a role of an authorized user? Are you in the role of a co-applicant? If you're in the role of a co-applicant, then yes, it, it will help to remove you, remove you from the account because you don't want that on your personal credit if they're, if they're paying late. If it's just an authorized user and you're not, it's not showing on your credit, then no need to worry about it. Hopefully that answers your question. All right, so piggybacking on someone, well, we, and we just kind of addressed that there, piggybacking on someone's good credit. So uh, yeah, I recommend parents do that if they can uh, do a co-applicant situation with their child uh, when they turn 17, 18, so that gives them instant history. Um, not only that, it starts their history, uh, and not only earlier, but it starts their own personal history probably before they normally would. I know I didn't start getting credit cards until I think I was in my 20s and out of college or whatever, but you know, if you can get that thing going and stoking at 17, 18 years old or whatever, um, and especially especially educating them. We didn't have the same level of financial education that we do right now. It's, a, it's getting much, much better, um, but you as a parent helping them along and helping them understand uh, that this is a real debt. It's out there that you gotta pay it back, you gotta use it responsibly, that kind of stuff helps tremendously. Um, and if you've got someone else who you can uh, piggyback off of, like because your credit got damaged for a little bit, whatever you can do, whatever you can, you've gotta exhaust every effort to try and get your credit where it needs to be. So. Uh, new to credit, yep, secured credit cards are options if you're new to credit, right? Uh, that's you sending the creditor a couple hundred bucks or whatever, and they give you a credit card in the exact same amount. Hopefully, you only have to use that for a little while. I believe you can get interest on that, making, you know, so you, so you do make some money off the money that you're tying up, but at the same time, if you need credit, most people uh, don't have the liquidity. So it's a great thing if you can do it. Uh, the problem is most people who need the credit don't have the liquidity anyway, so it's almost a moot point. So if you, you know, if you are a younger person or if you're dealing with a child or whatever, then that might be a good way to do it, right? At the same time, you're locking up your liquidity. And like I said, most people, um, you know, who, who need extensions of credit uh, don't have the liquidity to begin with. Okay, let's move to the next one. Seems like my video stopped working. There we go. <clears throat> All right, uh, data last activity represents the weight of an account. We kind of talked about that. So I think you guys have this down. What they're just showing you here is an example of uh, a 10,000 judgment versus a $14 you know, uh, collection, right? The $10,000 judgment was done three years ago and the Pizza Hut collection, right? Uh, you, just, you just paid it off. So the most recent activity of that, even though it's five years old, the most recent activity is just recently, just last month or whatever it is. So that's the one that's going to have more weight on the score. So this comes into play when we talk about the dance, right? And how we're going to kind of manipulate the algorithm, right? When it comes down to it, the, the paying off of that $14 might negatively impact your, um, your credit because it is more recent, even though it's from five years ago, even though it's way less than the $10,000 judgment you had from three years ago. Because the algorithm takes into account the date of last activity as the most relevant information, it might make sense for you to call Pizza and say, look, I'm going to pay off this collection. Um, I, need you to, I need you to eliminate it from my credit report to begin with, right? Or I need you to, to, to backdate it or to do something like that. If you can get them to do that, again, everything's a negotiation. The worst thing they can do is say no. And if they do say no, you can call back and try, try someone else and see if you can uh, get them to uh, eliminate it off your, if you pay it, for them to take it off your credit report, um, it's worth the shot. Because if you're gonna pay it off, then fine, pay it off, uh, but try, try not to have that be the last uh, activity on it because it's, like I said, it's gonna negatively impact your, uh, your score. Okay. It seems to be playing again. All right, here we go. So, available credits, right? The credit limit minus the amount you owe. 
um, this is kind of a common sense thing, right? So if you've been given $50,000 in available credit, revolving credit, trade credit, right? You'd like to keep that number of your borrowing against that credit to less than 15,000, right? That's 30% of 50,000. That's all it is. And, and that kind of maxes out your score, right? Uh, are there times that you can fluctuate, go above that, come back down? Yep. You know, if that's what you need to do, that's what you need to do. It's not a big deal. So uh, just make sure you've got a plan. Everything is about when they're going to pull your credit, right? So you need a backward plan. You just need to make sure that when it's time to pull that credit, it is the way that it needs to look. That doesn't mean that you can't use half or 75% of your revolving credit lines for something because you happen to be doing an extension or something like that on the house, and then you're going to refinance it when it's done or whatever. I mean, there's all different ways to scheme this thing out. You just need to know that when someone's going to pull your credit, it needs, the way, it needs to look the way that you need it to look, and you need to backward plan that so it is the way that you want it to be when they pull it. Another question in the chat here, if you decide to pay off everything on the credit report, how long will it take before things are considered healthy if they refuse or remove to backdate it? So everything with time, right? Time heals all wounds, right? Same thing with credit report. So for the first 24 years, it's going to be weighted heavily against you. It really is. For the first 24 months, it's weighted the most heavily. As time goes on, it just continues to become less and less and less impactful on your overall score. So, you know, look for the first six months to be probably the most traumatic. And then after that, it's going to continue to reduce and reduce and reduce. Um, but when it comes down to it, it's going to be reported for, like I said, no less than seven years, and it's going to be impactful on the score for no less than 24 months. All right, another question in the chat here is the 30% based off each individual credit item for all of your credit items as a, or all of your, it's both. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, actually, it's actually both, but the greater one is going to be the aggregate. So, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. If you can spread it out, can you spread it out over, over several cards? Um, if you need to be, right? Let's say you need to do something like that or whatever. Then, yes, I would say, hey, spread it out. Don't try and, you know, don't max one card up. And let's say that you've got four credit cards. Each, each credit card has 10 grand on it, or five credit cards. Each credit card has, has 10 grand on it, so that's 50 grand altogether. Um, don't max out two credit cards, right? Because it is going to look at that. So take a look at it and say, well, if I need to put 2000 on this one and 3000 on that one, 3000 on that one or whatever, uh, then that keeps it all still relatively low, right? Not to mention, you know, when, you, when it comes down to it, you're going to be looking at it, and it's also going to, it's also going to depend on the interest rate of that card. Right, so obviously you're going to choose to go the lower rates first, um, and again, maybe none of it matters. Right, it may not matter because you may be looking at your lowest rate card, which may be five percent, and then you may say, "Well, you know what? I am going to max this thing out. It goes up to fifteen grand. I'm going to I'm going to do this thirteen thousand dollar purchase on this because it's the lowest interest rate. But I know my credit's not going to be pulled for the next two years, per se. Per se, right?" Well, then it really doesn't matter as long as you can back the planet and say, I'm going to have this thing down to under 30% in that two-year time frame, right? Before I need credit again, I'm going to have it down to where it needs to be. So, again, the whole thing is a dance. The whole thing is a game. Um, they set up the rules of the game, and that doesn't mean that you can't um, use those rules to your advantage, okay? So, because the entire system is really geared to manipulate the way that you behave, right? So your job is to make sure that you can get what you need um, and make it appear that you are behaving the way they want you to behave. So it's all about appearances. That's all this is. So if you can do the dance properly and you can make it appear that you're behaving the way that they want you to behave, then heck, if you wanted to max out all your cards, you can max out all your cards. Right? If you want to max out all your cards because you know you're going to sell like, let's just say this, ha this, this happens a lot. What happens to me a lot is um, I'll get a lot of builders, right, or flippers, house flippers. What they'll do, they'll go to Lowe's, right, they'll buy a house, they'll go to Lowe's, they'll spend 50, 60,000 on their credit cards, right, to get all the stuff that they need at Lowe's to redo the house. And they know that they're putting the house in the market and they're going to sell. And right now it's a seller's market, so they're having no problem loading inventory. So they do all that work, right, they run up their cards, their credit score is actually, you know, it's it suppressed. It's hurting a little bit. But then they sell the house. You know, they make their 20%, 30% margin or whatever. They pay down the credit, you know, the credit um, the cards. And then the next time they have to go borrow for credit, it's like as if it, it never happened. 
It's like as if it never occurred. So you just have to know how to play the dance or how to dance the dance. All right, let's see here. Let's go to the next one. All right, again, link to history. I'm not really going to uh, beat this one up too much. Um, if you can piggyback on someone else's history, uh, best thing to do, but we've already kind of talked about that one. Uh, type of credit. Again, this really isn't all that, uh, you know, this one really isn't all that relevant for most people, and it is a much lower percentage of your overall score than anything else. However, uh, note the bottom there, that debt consolidation piece is, is huge. If you do have uh, credit card balances that you think are going to maybe not be paid off in the next five years or so, it might make sense to do this because you will see that immediate bump. Anybody who's ever done a debt consolidation, now, you know the interest rates are probably a little bit higher. However, at the same time, look at that interest rate compared to your um, variable rate, right? So if you take a look at the variable rate on your cards, usually that variable rate is in excess of 15%. If you're doing a debt consolidation loan, typically there's anywhere from 12 to 15%. So let's just say that all your cards are at like, I don't know, 17, 18, 19%, right? And you think it's gonna take you longer than five years to pay that off. So maybe it does make sense to go get a debt consolidation loan for 12% over the next five years have that immediate boost to your credit score, have that immediate improvement to your cash flow, right? Maybe it makes sense. Again, guys, you have to remember, all this is a dance. It's just a strategy. It's just how you play the game, okay? Because this is a game. And I take it, from, take it from the banker. This is a game. This game is to modify your behavior so that you do what the creditors want you to do. Take it from a creditor. That's how it is. So you need to know the game better than they do. You need to play the game better than they do, all right? They set up parameters which you can work in, and as long as you know how to do that, you'll be fine. All right, inquiries. Um, so this one's, you know, an inquiry doesn't hit you that much, five, ten points here and there. The problem that we typically find on inquiries is if you're shopping something, you know, uh, if you can, let's say you are shopping and you're using a lending tree type thing where maybe there's one poll, and then that gets shared with a lot of different lenders, that's probably beneficial. Um, if not, you know, you kind of you have to kind of protect it like anything else, and especially if you're on the bubble. If you're on the cusp, that's where it's important. If you're on one of those, you know, imaginary arbitrary bubble lines, like 640, 650, depending on what the that particular financial institution requires, um, like I said, I think actually for, I think for my bank, I think it might be 620, right? So if you're in a 625, and you know you're going to apply for a loan with me, but you're also trying to get a car, right? You're going to be carefully inquired because you may just push your credit down to the point where it's an exception to policy now for me, and it may be more difficult for me to get that loan approved, okay? So just be cognizant when you're dealing with uh, financial institutions, where's that threshold? Where's that bubble? So I have to be very, you know, careful in what inquiries. Uh, how can I limit my inquiries? Can I ask for a soft pull, right? Um, I always do soft pull. It's just my, you know, I've, I've dealt with the credit for a long time. And so I understand how credit impacts people. I understand how important it is. And so no matter what I do with soft pull, I don't like doing hard pulls. I don't know why if we've got uh, the option to do a soft pull, then I don't know why we would do a hard pull. So it's, it's literally the same information. It just does not impact your credit score. Literally, 100% same information. I pull a credit score or a credit report with a soft pull, I get the exact same information, the exact same report as I do with a hard pull. Not a lick of difference, not one little bit difference. The only thing it did is it didn't impact your credit score, all right? So if your banker's worth their salt, if that creditor's worth their salt, you can call them and you can ask them for a soft pull. So just my recommendation. All right, so what's a good credit score? Again, this is going to be dependent on, they give you an example here, but it really is going to be dependent on the financial institution. You know, um, uh, I think about uh, Mercedes and BMW credit, right? Those guys, they always talk about well-qualified buyers, right? So for them, a good credit score is 770 and above, right? You hit 770, great. You know, you're going to get 0% financing, 1% financing, whatever it is, right? Um, you can see here on you know, the, what they have here, they're just showing 692. If you walk into Mercedes with 692, um, that's not gonna be considered a good credit score, right? So just know your audience. Who's it going to, right? Who are you applying with? What are their internal policies? What's their threshold? It's okay to ask those questions. There is nothing wrong with asking those questions. And most bankers, frankly, will share that information with you. 
they'll give it to you. They'll say, look, here's where, here's where we need to be, right? In the end, we want to do business, right? In the end, we want to help you succeed. So go ask. Ask what the parameters are. Ask for, ask for it up front. Get that information, right? And then you'll know what to hit, right? And that also helps us. You know, when I, when I have somebody who comes to me and says, hey, I just need to know what your parameters are, you know, because I want to make sure I'm coming in correct. Right? Uh, that shows to me that, that discipline, that initiative, right? that motivation to do it properly, to do it properly the first time. You're doing your homework. Right? So there's nothing wrong with that. Ask for that information. All right, so five tips on improving your credit score here. Um, obviously, know what's in it. Right? That's one of the biggest things. So you go to annual credit report, you call the number, you need to find out what's in it. If you don't know what's in it, right? how are you going to be able to fix it? So how are you going to be able to do the dance if you don't know the steps, right? You need to know what's in that report. So always check it and make sure you've got it, especially before you're doing a major poll, before you're doing some kind of major purchase or whatever, definitely check it. I've made that mistake before. That's how I found out about my AT&T bill, right? I, I've, you know, you, you don't pull it. You think everything's fine. It's all great. When you go to do something, you find out there's a blemish on it. You're like, what? So uh, don't be surprised. Don't let that happen either. Obviously, pay your bills on time, budget accordingly. Uh, that one, you know, really doesn't even need to be said. You know that. Um, and especially as military members, right, we know that credit can trip us up, right? So uh, if we're not paying our bills on time or whatever, your support credit score, it can impact your uh, security clearance. Um, it can impact your, you know, you might, you know, what your first sergeant company is saying, hey, I've got a, uh, I got something from your military star card. I mean, I, how many, how many times have you heard that story? So. Learn the legal steps to correct your credit report. Um, so again, uh, the first step, call them, all right? A lot of them will deal with you. And especially now, uh, there seems to be, like I said, a little bit more of uh, an amenable tone with the creditors now because of the pandemic. So if something's out there, please, you know, uh, call them first, negotiate it with a first. If you don't like the answer you get, hang up with that person, call back, get someone else, Try that, and I've tried that multiple times. If that doesn't work, then there are legal steps that you can take because you can dispute it. You can dispute it with those three credit reporting agencies. You can write letters. There are other paid services. I don't think I would recommend that only because um, the paid service is going to do the same thing that you do. They can only do the same things that you do. They can only call on your behalf. They can only write letters on your behalf. They can only dispute it with the credit reporting agencies. They're doing the exact same thing. So before you put out any money for someone else to do it, I would exhaust, I would exhaust those methods on your own first. Uh, let's see, a credit here. Has credit card companies become more stringent due to auto pay options since it's easy to do for most people? So they haven't become more stringent. What they, you know, why they like auto pay is because, you know, it's a little bit less of a gamble, right? Um, <coughs> if you see the way that auto pay is typically set up, and you may not even notice it, but a lot of times when you're doing auto pay, what they end up doing is they end up setting your auto pay date before your date is actually due, right? So you end up getting a loan, let's say it's a car loan. You end up getting a loan and you agree to do the auto payment because it's USA and they're gonna give you a quarter percent off the interest rate, right? Which is uh, pretty common, quarter percent, half percent, whatever. Um, when you take a look at the loan docs, you'll see that, oh, my, my payment is due on a 20th, right? But then you take a look at what the auto payment date is, the auto payment date is something like the 17th or 16th or 15th, right? So this is a, this is a method of control, right? So what it does is it gives the bank a little bit more control. They're getting the payment a little bit sooner because that alerts them a little bit quicker. If the auto pay doesn't hit, let's say you don't have the money in the account and the auto pay doesn't hit, well, now, now they've got a signal that something may be off, something may be wrong. And a lot of times people don't even notice. They take a look at it and they think, oh, okay, my auto pay is going to come out on this day. And that's when they think the actual payment due date is because they never went and looked at the loans. But when you take a look at the loan document itself, you find out they actually put a five-day pad in there. So... It's really a control mechanism for the creditors, for the financial institution. So I'll just keep that in the back of your mind. <clears throat> uh, let's see, creating another oh, the chat's moving. All right. Now I know what these podcast people feel like. All right. Let's see. Are you creating another metric for makeup? No, yeah, it's not, it's not, like I said, it's not really a metric thing. Um, and basically, what it just comes down to is it comes down to they want to have greater control over when they think you're going to pay. So uh, it gives them greater control if they have auto debit, and it gives them uh, a greater understanding of uh, of your 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 if something's gone wrong if that auto payment doesn't work. 
How legitimate are credit repair programs? Some claim to remove bad information for free. Uh, I, if you're good at anything, why would you do it for free? I don't understand why. Um, how does a company work for free? So I would ask myself that right away. Oh, for a fee. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, so that's the thing. They, they are providing you a service, right? So they will, you know, they will do the same thing, but they can only do legally the same thing that you can do. So, you know, they can write the letter. They can they can dispute it with experience. They can write the letter to experience. So basically, what they're saying is they're saying it's like it's almost like grant writing, right? Hey, I don't have time to do it. I want you to do it. I'm going to pay you to do it. You do you do it. You be the dog on the bone. You go after it. You get my credit score fixed. So, you know, uh, they claim to be able to do that. But if you take a look in the you know, in a very small print, you'll see that they're not doing anything that you can't already do on your own. You can do all of that on your own. If you have the time and the inclination, you can do it on your own because it doesn't cost much, right? You can get an account on Experian, TransUnion, Equifax. You can dispute it right there. You can provide all the information right there. You can do everything that they can do. There's nothing that they can do that you can't other than maybe provide a letter that's got an attorney's um, letterhead on it. And guess what? It's not like these credit card companies haven't seen them before. So just because it's got the you know ESQ on the letterhead doesn't mean anything to these credit reporting companies. So you can dispute it the same as they can. Let's see. I'm an Experian subscription. I can check my credit whenever I want, but they offer a service that can boost my credit score. So I input all my bills and what I pay for them. Does that feature actually work to boost your credit? So what yes it does but how it does it is a little deceiving deceiving um what they do with that is they basically expand right they expand out the amount of creditors so what they're saying is is hey you know let's say you're not super good at paying your auto loan you're okay with paying your credit card but you pay your rent every month on time no problem well let's do this let's add your other bills in here who are not creditors because you didn't sign a formal credit application with them these are just other bills so we'll look at these other bills and we'll start adding that into that algorithm as if it was a creditor so if you pay great on all these other bills um, electric you know uh, water gas sewage rent it you know so so that really depends on your behavior so if you pay those things on time okay but what you're doing is you're adding more variables right so you're adding more complications to it. And if one of those other companies messes up somehow, right, then that may get reported, right? And now it may work against you. So you've really just got to look at your own personal behavior and say, okay, does this make sense for me? What do I want to add if I want to add anything? So just be cognizant of how that could turn around and bite you, but it does actually work. So if you're a person who says, hey, I've got my, my all of my utilities, they're, they're, I've never had a problem with it. Decades gone by, no problem, always on time, no issue. Maybe it doesn't make sense. So again, case by case basis on that one. All right, let's see here. Okay, good, handled all the questions in the chat. Um, so back to the slide here. Uh, let's see, understanding how your score is determined. We talked about that ad nauseum. Uh, be aware of your credit report scan so you can fix it yourself. Oh, okay, so we, we already talked about that. So again, Everything that they can do, we can do, right? We, we, as, we as individual consumers, right, we can do it also. The thing about this is you've got to be a dog on a boat. You really do. You've got to be just adamant and on it, all right? Sometimes, even if it's your fault, you can wear them down, all right? And I've got, you know, maybe I take an atypical stance on it because, uh, again, I've had credit issues before due to deployment particular in particular. Um, you know, it's, uh, I understand how you, these things can get wrapped up. Um, so one of the things that we often see a lot of times is medical bills. That's one of the biggest ones that we see. We see people out there who have $14 medical bills. They have $16 medical bills, 18, $86 medical bills. They go in, they get a surgery. You're charged by 15 different service providers, right? Because there's cotton ball, there's alcohol, there's anesthesia, there's the doctor doing a the surgery, there's the nurse moving the bedpan, all these people are billing you, right? And now you've got to try and keep track with all these bills. And oh yeah, there's an insurance component to it. And a lot of us feel that our insurance is going to pay for whatever we don't, we don't initially get billed for. 
You know, but as it turns out, some of these bills don't go to the insurance companies. One of the insurance company denies it. And so what the hospital will do is they'll first send it to you and try and get you to do to pay it off because it's easier to convince you to pay it than to go back and fight with the insurance company. So we see medical bills a lot and there is some legislation moving forward to try and kind of negate the impact that medical bills have on credit reports because the, that has been a, a thorn in a lot of people's sides. You know, at one of the most vulnerable times of your life, you know, uh, hospitals, insurance companies, and credit reporting companies are taking advantage. And that has been heard loud and clear, and they are moving on legislature on that, and I hope it does go through, and I, I hope it does uh, negate the impact of medical bills because, again, that's a very, very difficult one, and I see them absolutely all the time with some of my best clients who have never missed payments. We're talking 20, 30 years, and they've never missed any payment, but they get into – you know, one accident or they get one sickness, whatever, and now all of a sudden they have some credit report issues with medical bills. And a lot of times they don't even know, it. they didn't even know it because they got these bills and they, they, they assume that insurance was going to take care of them because they understand how their insurance works. But the insurance plays this game with the hospital and pushes back. So just make sure you're looking at all of those. I got another question in the chat here. Do I need to have an official LLC or corporate EIN in order to apply for a business loan or business credit? Well, we'll get into that uh, in the next, um, you know, in the next one. But uh, yeah, you do. If if you, we do check with the SEC. I'm here in Virginia, and so you know, we check with the Virginia uh, State uh, Corporation Agreement, right? Uh, so if you, if it is going to an LLC or whatever, then obviously yes, you have to have that. Now, a lot of times, depending on the structure that you take, if it's a pass-through structure, you may not need to create. Uh, another business. You know, the business could be a single member LLC that runs through your personal tax return. So, but, but there are, you are going to have to probably create organizational documents and do that kind of stuff or whatever. Now, if you're starting the process for the loan, you don't need it all immediately. I have plenty of people who come and let's say they want to buy a, a commercial property, but they haven't set up the LLC yet. So they come to me and they say, look, I'm going to do this as a single member LLC, single asset LLC. I'm going to create the LLC before we close. I need you to consider you know, looking at the building, looking at the cash flow from the building, look at me personally, you know, tell me if I qualify for the loan first. So not a problem. You can apply for the loan before having the LLC set up, all right? Uh, you just need to, you know, how we would approve it is we would approve it in the personal name or LLC Inc. to be created, that kind of thing. I do that a lot of times, especially for people who deal with um, real estate portfolios, and they put each one of their real estate investments in its own LLC. I see that happen quite quite frequently, not usually a big deal. So it all really depends. It's case-by-case -case basis. But like I said, if you're talking about real estate assets and single-member entities, uh, it, it, it's not an issue. And a good banker will know that the, the answer to that question will be able to tell you. Uh, do I use my own social security number for business accounts or AIN of the business? <clears throat> so, uh, again, this depends on the type of structure you're doing. If you're doing a pass-through structure, that's going to stay on your, um, on your personal tax return. Because this is really an accountant question. Right, because the accountants basically determine this. They take a look at it and say, "Look, look, you you keep your own tax ID, your your own EIN, and uh, we're going to run it through your Schedule C or your Schedule E or your personal tax return. Not a big deal." And so, you know, here's your organizational documents. Your, you know, and we're just going to run it through the schedules of your personal tax return. In that instance, you keep your own EIN. You know, but if your accountant says, "I think it's a good idea to have a separate." entity because of some, you know, some favorable tax treatment, then they'll get you their own EIN, you'll do articles of incorporation, and, you know, you'll do all the organizational documents behind that, and then that will have its own tax return. So you really have to talk to your accountant to find out which structure is going to be the best for your scenario. So it, it, it goes both ways. And if you, and if you change your mind later, and it becomes more favorable from a tax perspective to move it onto your personal tax return, your accountant can do that also, all right? They just, uh, you know, they would just simply uh, choose to change uh, the, 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 the type of entity that you are, you know, or the type of reporting you are. But that is very heavily an accounting um, question. So make sure you get with your accountant. You gotta be, you gotta make sure you surround yourself with good people. Again, you gotta make sure that you've got a good banker that you trust, right? That's gonna give you the no nonsense, Bottom line up front, right? Because nobody wants to waste anybody's time, right? I don't want anybody wasting my time and I don't want to waste their time particularly. So you got to have a good banker that's going to be straight with you. 
and then you've got to have a good accountant and you've got to have a good attorney. And I know the attorney component is expensive, but um, if at all possible, you know, I don't know, you find a friend, you do whatever you can do in the beginning, but you need to have somebody opining on those kind of things because you don't want to get tripped up at the beginning. It can cost you a ton of money on the back end. All right, welcome back, everybody. All right, so <clears throat> we're going to now move into one of the more interesting portions of the session, um, talking about financing your venture. Again, one of the more uh, important ones for sure because this is something that almost every business owner faces from one time to another, even if you don't start your own business with your own internal equity or your own personal cash flow or liquidity. A lot of times down the line, especially if you're expanding, you know, if you're trying to purchase an asset of some sort or whatever, uh, it'll come to a point where you need to uh, look for a particular type of capital stack in order to get to the next um, area that you need to. So real quick, we're going to watch this Kaufman sketchbook. Um, it's a really cool thing. I think it's out there on YouTube. Um, very awesome. Probably one of the more, I'd have to say, probably one of the more realistic videos that I've ever seen done. I know it's done by a lot of, uh, I think it's by a lot of professors or whatever, but uh, they actually did a good job putting this one together. And, and it really does uh, it really does reflect uh, how business financing is. So real quick, I'm going to click on this. Hopefully this thing works. If it's not working or you can't hear it, you can't see it, can't hear it, just let me know. We'll see if we can't get Troy on the horn, but I'm going to go ahead and see if I can get this thing going. the audio just cut out almost every young company you can think of to one degree or another was funded on credit cards and it is the single largest source of capital for young companies after founder savings and then the next place where they tend to get money is from friends and family after i've tapped out my credit card and i've used up all my savings i turn to people i know and say hey will you help me and that's the third biggest source place is banks and the banks are a totally weird situation because with banks they get a lot of attention, but they actually fund very, very few young companies. But it's not their fault. You have to think about the way bank lending works. Shareholders want banks to lend. They want them to lend money against secured assets. And young companies don't have any security. They have nothing to secure it against. And the joke in the industry is, is you can get all the bank funding you want as a startup as long as you don't need it. And then the last piece is venture capital bullets. They get the lion's share of the attention, which in some ways is warranted. You know, your Googles and Apples and FedExes and many others all have venture capital money inside of them. But the reality is, and this is from Kaufman research, less than 20% of the fastest growing companies in the United States took any venture money. And that's not because the VCs wouldn't give it to them, because they didn't want it or didn't need it, because they had all those, I don't need money, and I certainly don't need money on these terms. Because, you know, venture capitalists, unlike banks, they don't lend against secured assets. They give you money in exchange for shares. So they take some of your company away. So my answer is, if you don't need it, definitely don't get it. There's no question the venture industry has become state. The irony is it's intended to fund disruption, and yet it's an industry that had become complacent. And interestingly,
interestingly, over the last five or six years, we've seen the emergence of other mechanisms for funding, like AngelList, like these kinds of peer-to-peer -peer funding sources, as people increasingly provide capital in smaller amounts, but more people doing it. Having said all of that, though, venture capitalists are hugely important for those young companies that don't have access to bank money, are growth companies. They have the prospect of being a $5 million or a $10 million company in a couple of years, and they need that growth capital to get there quickly. So it's a race. And the way you play the race is by getting money from people like venture capitalists who give you the money so you can, you can compete with other people who are racing as fast as you are. If you can run a company in some combination of credit card, your own savings, and friends and family, you know, Bob's your uncle, run, run. You know, keep all the equity because, you know, there's no better thing than being full control of your own destiny. Thank you, Bob. Okay. All right, like I said, I think that's a real good introduction to this uh, this particular class here you know, because it is 100% true. And a lot of you are going to find this out when you get out there, you know, when you when you start talking to banks, financial institutions about the kind of loans that you can get to start up your businesses. Uh, some of them won't even talk to you. So some of the larger, and I'm, I'm not trying to, you know, dog on anybody or whatever, but every financial institution has its own internal policy. So for some, that policy is, no new businesses. Um, you've probably already heard the old statistic about how most businesses fail within the first two or three years, right? So for that, uh, you know, for that reason, a lot of larger financial institutions in particular just won't even bother with it. They'll basically say, look, come back to us when you have 24 months experience. Or this needs to be in our SBA department because, uh, frankly, the risk is too high from a uh, repayment uh, uh, perspective or from a collateral perspective or something like that. So a lot of times you're going to be dealing with uh, regional, small, community-sized banks because a lot of them, the majority of them, are the ones who do the lending for new businesses and startups. Um, and a lot of times they work with the SBA, but we'll talk about that as well. So, all right, jumping into the slide here. We're going to take a look at uh, both debt and equity because all of your assets, all of your cash flow, all that, uh, you know, a cash is an asset. Um, all of that is going to be financed one way or another, right? And there's only two ways that it can be financed. It's going to be financed in debt or equity. That's what's called your capital stack. Right? And you can see down in the questions below, um, it talks about what type of capital is most appropriate, right? And so for a lot of folks, the capital itself is just going to be equity, right? And if you're starting with your own money, you know, uh, I know that a lot of business, uh, especially a lot of military, right? They'll go away, they'll deploy, you're getting that um, non, non-taxed federal dollars, right? And so uh, you're able to save up some money. You're saving up on some bills. You know, you've aggregated 50, 60, 70,000 in cash, right? Now you, you're going to start your business with your own equity. So a lot of times your capital stack is literally just equity. But for a lot of other business owners, they're going to need to purchase large assets. They're going to need to purchase um, or they're going to need some money to hold them um, from a cash flow perspective because they're going to have to pay uh, lease. They're going to have to pay employees. They're going to have to pay utilities, all these things or whatever. And it's going to be a run-up until they can get their business uh, going so that it's generating uh, routine and regular revenue. So a lot of times they're going to need debt. And so the combination of the two is what your capital stack is. So what is debt? We take a look. We've got bank loans. We've got uh, – these allow you to maintain ownership and control because if you're getting money from a creditor, the creditor is not going to come in and tell you how to run your business. They will tell you if you're not running your business successfully and you're, you know, you're in the red. Uh, they're going to want you to get back in the black. They're going to make some recommendations, things like that or whatever. But for the most part, we don't tell you how to run your business. If your business is failing for some reason, um, you know, and I've lent money to you, then I come to you and I ask you about your plan. So what plan are you using? What are you going to do? Show me your projections. You know, how are you going to get back in the black? And so, But I'm not going to tell you how to do it because that's not my business. I don't know what it is. I don't know what you do. And even if I do know what you do, and even if I've seen it done better, uh, there's liability on banks' parts, so they really can't make recommendations as to how you run your business. Requires repayment with interest, <clears throat> um, so it's really interesting, right, because you borrow principal, but then you have to pay that principal back in interest. Um, so that means that you're going to have to create an, um, a revenue stream that generates enough cash flow to pay back not only the principal, but the interest as well. So, and uh, it is interesting, I would think, in today's day and age, 2022, that you wouldn't have to 
really tell a lot of people that, but it is very interesting how people get a little bit out of shape about interest because um, interest is, you know, a principal is basically principal. When we are, as a bank, what we do a lot of times is we use bank deposits to lend, but then we also borrow sometimes from the Fed. And so if we're borrowing, we're paying interest on that also. So that gets built into our cost of business. So that, so we have no choice but to charge interest on the principal that we lend out. Because the principal typically isn't our money anyway. It's either depositor's money or we borrowed it from somewhere else, from discount window or something else. So the only way that we keep the lights on in the bank is by charging interest and fees. And people hate fees. <laughs> so uh, probably more than they dislike interest. So... Uh, generally considered the cheapest way to grow because of interest rates right now. Interest rates are ticking up a little bit. However, most of the loans that I do are still in the 4% range. So when you compare that to, let's say you're financing your venture mostly with credit cards. So if you compare that with your credit cards and your credit cards range anywhere from 10 to 20%, well then 4% is an extremely um, um, profitable way to go because the expense ratio on that is, is ridiculously small. So, you know, and, it, and it, it doesn't have the same things as equity. When you take a look at equity over there, equity involves investors. Investors involve opinions. Opinions involve feelings, right? That's kind of how that goes. So just keep in mind that when you're dealing with an equity partner, an equity partner is not the same as kind of like your financial institution to where they, they allow you to maintain the, the ownership and control. You know, if they've got a recommendation, remember, they put their money in the business. They're going to have a, you know, they're going to make a recommendation. Now, at the same time, that's not to say that you can't, you know, through using your attorney, that you can't structure something appropriate to where they've got say, but limited say, or no say at all. They could be a silent partner. You just have to know to set that up properly up front. So if you are going into a partnership, just make sure that you've got the exit agreement agreed upon up front before anything's done. While everybody's breaking their arms, patting each other on the back because of this great thing that you guys are going to do, that's when you structure the exit agreement. If you wait until something's gone sideways and there's a disagreement, it becomes a humongous mess. So if you're going to go in the partnership with somebody, if you're going to get equity investors, make sure that the exit is structured up front when everybody's happy. Again, like money's exchanged for ownership. So again, you're, you're not, this isn't a debt component. This is you giving away part of your company. Okay. Uh, the money's not paid back, and that's in the sense of, you know, if they have ownership interest of it, you know, they're looking at making a, you know, like a, a return on their investment. They're not getting paid the money back, per se, unless you buy them out or unless they sell it to someone else. But for the most part, they're looking on a return on investment. So they've given you $10,000. Now they're looking for a return on it, okay, in the form of distributions or dividends or something like that. Um, <clears throat> so it means you have shareholders, right? Um, I think we kind of covered that with, with a little bit earlier and can have huge benefits beyond the money. So that is one of the big things about um, if you're looking at doing equity. Equity is not just a financial investment, but now you've got someone else who's got skin in the game, right? A lot of times, they, I mean, I, obviously, in every instance, they want to see it to succeed as well because, again, they want a greater return on their investment. So a lot of times, you know, you bring an equity partner in, you might be bringing a partner in who's maybe great at marketing. Um, maybe they are, uh, a, you know, very good at networking and they, they have already distribution channels set up. You know, maybe they've got some experience in that industry, so they can help that way. You know, uh, they might be brilliant when it comes to the, the finance component of it, you know. So there are a lot of benefits that could come in beyond that, but you want to know that going up front, right? You want to make sure that you're bringing somebody in who complements your business, who you're going to be able to work with, Right, and who brings some other stuff to the table, typically not just financial, but a lot of times I understand it. That's what a lot of people are looking for. They're looking for the financial backing. Um, just make sure if all you're looking for is the financial backing, again, make sure that that partnership is set up correctly in the front end so someone doesn't think that they're coming in managing that business with you. Right? They're coming in as a financial backer, and that's it, and their return is going to be profit, dividend, that kind of stuff. Not you know, co-president of the company. You just got to make sure that that's, um, that, that, that's that, that, that is agreed upon up front. All right, so some important questions to ask yourself. <clears throat> How much money do I need? All right. This is, this is super, 
super important if you're going to borrow money, all right? If you come in and you don't know how much money you need, the first thing that tells me is you didn't do your homework, right? Because I'm going to ask for a business plan. I'm going to ask for a pro forma, right, projection. And based on those cash flow projections, that's going to show me how much you need and why you need it. So, and, 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 and the reason why I kind of pause and stress on this one is because I'm amazed at how many people come in and don't know how much money they need. They sometimes will say, how much can I get? My answer that day is nothing. Today you get nothing. Today you get advice, which is probably worth more than the money at this point. So go back, sharpen your pencil, finish your business plan, do your projection, you know, determine your cash flow needs, and then come back with a number. Um, because we don't know. And if I did know, then I would just be running your business, right? So I need to see it. I need to know what you're doing. And that whole thing, that strategy, it's laid out in that business plan, right? That is the map, right? So that is the map for our navigation, right? We're doing land nav. That's our map and our compass right there. Boom. There, there's now a plot X. I'm going to plot Y, right? Got all the terrain features, blah, blah, blah. That is what your business plan is, right? And that's the map that we need as a, as, as a banker or, you know, as an equity partner or whatever. We need to know what's going in there. Well, that is, your, that is a plan. So when people come to me and they don't know how much they need, for me, it's an easy, you know, conversation at that point. You know, I say, hey, look, you're, you know, it sounds interesting, whatever, but we're not there yet. You know, we get there when you know how much you need, when you've done the math behind it, when you understand everything that's going into that plan for the next one to three years. That's when we get there. So if you want to avoid you, if you want to avoid some embarrassment, don't go in, especially to a creditor, not knowing how much you need or asking, how much can I get? Uh, how much control do I need? That comes down to the type of capital stack that you want, right? So again, if you are a person who maybe doesn't play well, in, you know, uh, with others in the sandbox, and we all know, we've all either been that person or we've all worked with that person before. Um, just know that if you're that individual, maybe you don't do well with a lot of partners and a lot of other people poking their noses in your business. It's okay. Accept that and drive on. If you need to be the one, the sole decision maker, right, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. You need to find a way to be that person. Because if not, long term, you take someone on and you just think that you're going to be coercive and you're going to get them to acquiesce and do what you want every single time, it almost never works that way. And it ends for really messy breakups. Okay, so just just know yourself. Be honest with yourself. Be true to yourself. If you need to have that control, then you probably, if you're looking for a perfect capital stack for you, it's your own equity plus maybe some debt or just your own equity, um, but maybe not a partner. Uh, what's my bargaining position? So in the beginning, you don't really have that much of a bargaining position when you're starting a business. However, that doesn't say that you can't ask the question, right? Audacity is rewarded, right? So if let's just say that you're dealing with a vendor and you want to get a certain amount of pallets or whatever it is, you know, and they let's say they only sell them in thousands, right? Because a lot of these vendors deal in bulk. There's nothing wrong for you with you in the saying to them, hey, look, I'm a new business and I know you're gonna want my business going forward because or you know, because I'm I am going to be successful in this and my orders are going to increase exponentially. But right now I cannot afford a thousand units of this. And I know you sell them both. Is there any way that you can carve this down and maybe sell a hundred units of these or 50 units or whatever it is? And guess what? A lot of times those vendors will be willing to do that because they do want your future business, right? So there's nothing wrong with asking the question. The worst thing that anybody can say is no. And guess what? You're not asking them to marry you, right? You're simply asking, well, are you guys willing to, to, to do this and take a look at this? All right, I have a check. Let's say I need 40,000 for my business. What is a good interest to expect and how long should I spread out the repayment or typically how long do people finance these types of loans? So unfortunately, every single one of these scenarios is done on a case-by-case -case basis, right? No two deals that I've done are alike, right? Unless they are with the same people and involve the same assets, but it's, it's relatively good. So if you need a 40,000, the first piece would be, what do you need it for? Are you purchasing an asset? Are you, do you need it for cash flow? Right? Because if you need it for cash flow, maybe you just need a line of credit that's going to revolve every three months. 